Okay. Okay, before we begin, I just want to make sure you know that one of the presentations is in Spanish, so if you need um, headphones. Okay, well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Erika de la Garza, and I'm the program director of the Baker Institute's Latin America Initiative. On behalf of the Institute and the Organization of American States, uh, we're delighted to welcome you to this evening's panel on building green economies in the Americas. As you know, this is part of this panel is part of the Americas Project, which is an annual program that we have in collaboration with the Organization of American States. And in the past 16 years, we've brought together over 160 um, young upcoming leaders, representing 31 of the 35 countries in the Americas, to facilitate an informed and open dialogue on critical issues facing the region, as the ones our panelists will address tonight. We are proud to have with us 14 leaders um, representing exactly as many countries. And for the next couple of days, they will be discussing the costs and benefits of building green economies, the domestic strategies being adopted in each of their countries to achieve these goals, and the financial support needed during this transition. The United Nations Environment Program defines a green economy as one that results in improved human well-being and social equity, while significantly reducing environmental risks and ecological scarcities. Tonight, we have a remarkable group of speakers whose expertise will help gui guide us in gaining a better understanding of some of the complexities involved in this topic and the important role each sector of society plays. I have to mention the background of one of our speakers, Tarsila Rivera. 12 years ago, Tarsila was sitting in the audience representing she was the up-and-coming leader from Peru in the Americas Project of 2000. We are very excited to have her along with the other panelists with us tonight. And now I am very pleased to introduce our moderator, Magdalena Talamas, who is the OAS Peace Fund Chief and to whom we are ever so grateful for her dedication to the Americas Project. Please help me in welcoming our speakers. Thank you. Thank you very much and welcome again. Um, I'd like to briefly introduce our expert panel tonight. Um, I'm not going to read their bios because you already have them in their program, but um, I would like to first present um, Dr. Juan Carlos Belausti Goitia. <laughs> Difficult to, <laughs> yes, it's a vast uh, last name. Um, <laughs> Dr. Belausti Goitia. Dia is uh, he's the executive director of the Centro Mario Molino in Mexico City. Um, Mario Molino, as I'm sure you know, is a <laughs> Nobel uh, laureate in chemistry, a Mexican Nobel laureate. laureate. Tarsila, uh, who, um, as Erika said, I met uh, in the year 2000 as a fellow here, and it's a true honor to have her here, here again, but on the other side of, uh, of the room. Uh, thank you very much, Tarsila. It's very nice to see you again. And Tarsila is a fervent um, um, supporter of indigenous women's rights, and she also heads the Chirapac Institute um, for the promotion of um, uh, indigenous culture in Peru, among uh, many other <laughs> things that she does. Cletus Springer, um, also an honor to have you here. Um, my colleague and friend Cletus from the Organization of American States. He's the director of the Department of Sustainable Development at the OAS. Welcome, Cletus. Mm -hmm. I would like to suggest maybe if we can start with the private sector. Um, we're going to be uh, speaking about today um, the role of the private sector, the role of civil society, and the role of government in uh, green economies. And uh, Dr. Belausti Goitia is going to uh, start off with the role of the private sector. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, my, it's uh, when I received the invitation, I wondered why I was invited to talk about the private sector because I don't work for the private sector. Uh, uh, I worked for the private sector when I was uh, a professor at the Mexican, at a very good uh, Mexican university, a private university. 
uh, my family has businesses, but they, uh, I was first a professor, then uh, a government official, and then and, uh, again a professor at the University of California in Berkeley, and then I moved to uh, the international bureaucracy. I was uh, uh, lead environmental economist for uh, Latin America and the Caribbean at the World Bank for the last uh, eight years. But, uh, and, and so my, my, my main responsibility was to advise uh, governments, of course, uh, uh, trying to tell them the best way to uh, organize public, uh, environmental public policy that has to do with uh, the behavior of uh, the private sector, but also of, of uh, uh, consumers uh, uh, and, and, and other economic agents. But, so I, I have, uh, I think, a uh, few interesting things to tell you, but uh, I'm not going to talk only about uh, the private sector. I'm going to talk about uh, a more general uh, public policy and then focus on the private sector uh, investment opportunities in, in Mexico. Okay. Um, is this? There we are. Uh, the outline of, of the talk, I mean, there are, there's a wealth of definitions of, of green growth. I mean, for every person that thinks about the green growth, there is at least one definition. I'm going to use a very restrictive definition of, 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 green, of green growth. Uh, I'm going to talk later about the, the importance of natural capital and how growth can be interpreted as a portfolio uh, a management uh, problem. Uh, then I'm going to ask whether uh, environmental policy can contribute to, to growth. Uh, and I'm going to illustrate this with uh, the example of Mexico. Then I'm going to move on to, to the challenges that, that, that uh, the private sector's involvement in uh, green growth or investing in green growth uh, phase, and they finish with some recommendations. And then I have two appendixes uh, to make it more uh, uh, pragmatic. Uh, I'm going to give, of course, uh, lots of, of figures, but I'm going to show you how things are changing. I mean, Walmart is a very a uh, business-oriented, very pragmatic corporation, and I'm going to show you that, that at least Walmart, Mexico, and Central America is really changing its, its behavior and how they are uh, considering uh, the green economy and investing in, in, in renewables and, and greening their operations uh, as, a, a very, as a very good business opportunity. And I'm going to finish off with the equator principles in the previous talk, uh, uh, several of my friends and, well, now friends and, and, and colleagues talked about the importance of the finance uh, um, sector. And uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the equator principles, but uh, this is a, a set of principles that that, uh, that rule uh, the most important uh, banks and it has to do with uh, a corporate responsibility with regard to environment and, and social responsibility. Okay, so that's the, the outline of the talk. I hope you find it uh, interesting. What is green growth? Again, there are a million uh, definitions, but I'm going to use a very restrictive one. Uh, and just to try to get what's new about this concept of green growth. I mean, a lot of people think that green growth is old wine in new bottles. No? What, what makes green growth different from uh, sustainable development? Uh, what makes uh, green growth different from the three Ps, no profits, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, why, why do we have to come up, or why did some organizations, some countries, come up with a new uh, definition? Is it because they wanted to uh, uh, forget about their commitments with regard to sustainable development. That's what a very large group of countries think, that develop, developed countries, that industrialized countries, uh, created this concept to, to uh, 
forget to, to uh, uh, run away from their commitments in Rio and in other uh, uh, gatherings, international gatherings. Uh, but I think that theoretically, I mean, again, I'm, I'm, I'm no longer a professor, but I was a professor, and I think that there is some new, there are some new aspects in this concept of, of green growth. And so I'm going to use the, this very restrictive way in which uh, we can interpret uh, green growth, and I'm going to say that uh, green growth is ab about making economic growth processes resource efficient, cleaner, less polluting, and more resilient without slowing them. Of course, I'm not, I'm just as interested as any of you in the social aspect. I mean, we, had, we just had a three hour conversation about green economies, and the first thing that uh, the first participant said is that green growth has to do with social uh, issues. And of course, when we consider the, the, the whole package, uh, the environment, the social issues, and the economy have to be integrated. But again, uh, to be precise and to look at the new things that I think that this concept has, I'm going to look only at how environmental policy can promote economic, economic growth. That doesn't mean to say that the social impacts are forgotten. I mean, I, I could just as well make a case for how important the environment is to promote uh, the alleviation of poverty and other social goals. So if, if we only look at that, uh, if you consider that there are, there are three pillars of sustainable development, the social, the environmental, and the economic uh, pillars, I'm going to look only at the relation, at the link between the environmental and the, and the economic pillars. So in, in what are the objectives then, if we only consider that? Uh, link, uh, improving resource management and boosting productivity, promoting economic activity where it's best, uh, where it's best for society over the long term, and boosting uh, innovation. Uh, you are all familiar with the concept of capital, uh, physical capital, machines, buildings, f perhaps financial capital too. Some of you may be uh, familiar with the concept of uh, human capital. Uh, capital, cap, uh, capital goods are assets that provide, uh, that produce income in a sustainable way. And this is very, very important. The concept of income, as defined by Pigou in the 1920s, 1930s, uh, implied sustainability. And it's very easy for, for, for us to understand that real income implies sustainability, sustainable income. Let me give you a very uh, easy uh, to understand, an, an, an example that is very easy to understand with, uh, uh, with financial variables. If you have $100 in the bank and the rate of interest is 10% a year, then you can consider the real uh, rate of interest is 10% a year, then you can consider that your income a year per year is ten dollars, but what happens if one year you take the ten dollars of interest and the fifty and fifty dollars out of the capital? Is your income sixty dollars? Of course not. You are eating up fifty dollars of, of of capital. That will uh, decrease the capacity of your capital to produce income in the in the future. And that very easy to understand idea was there when, when Pigou, the first person, the first economist that, that, that uh, defined the uh, uh, national accounting uh, methods, um, thought about this. And of course, when, when, when uh, national accounts um, estimate uh, real income and investment, they uh, take away uh, the depreciation of physical capital. But when you think about capital and growth, and as 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 a, when you think about growth as being the a, a outcome of the interaction of several forms of capital, I mean, physical capital is not the only way in which you can create a, a income. You have you have also human capital, the the, the skills and the 
uh, ability to work of, of people. And you have natural capital, you have natural resources and, and other forms of, of, of natural uh, capital. The problem is that uh, uh, the traditional uh, national accounts don't include the depreciation and the degradation of natural capital. They do include the, nat the, the depreciation of physical capital, but they don't include the, the, the depreciation of, of natural capital. The World Bank has this um, uh, indicator of, of sustainability uh, called uh, true savings or genuine savings. What's that? Uh, the capacity to grow sustainably, sustainably uh, is given by uh, the, um, by whether or not your stock of capitals decreases or increases with time. Uh, when you increase capital, you call that investment. And to invest, you have to save. That's the only way you have you you, you can you can increase capital and, and, and grow economically. This graph shows you with the uh, help of this of this new concept how certain countries the countries is this also a laser opa is this also laser uh, okay the countries in the upper left hand uh, uh, side are growing uh, the, the GDP per capita is growing, but only because they are eating up natural capital. Natural capital is measured along the uh, horizontal axis. So there are many countries that think that they are growing, but it's only because they are eating up their capital. Uh, Venezuela is one case, the typical case. Uh, Bolivia was one case uh, in the past, and now they have a, they are moving into a more sustainable uh, pattern. But there are many countries that think that that they are growing, but uh, in actuality they they, they they are eating up their uh, capital. Uh, so genuine savings, and then there is the definition of uh, genuine. Uh, savings or ad adjusted net savings uh, are a way to indicate whether the the uh, the growth is sustainable. The definition is uh, net national savings. Net national savings means that you are already taking out, you are already discounting uh, uh, the depreciation of physical capital, but then you have you add education expenditure, but because that adds to, to uh, human capital. And you uh, uh, produce, uh, uh, take out energy depletion, mineral depletion, net forest depletion, carbon dioxide and particulate emission damage. And of course, there are many other ways in which the environment can be degraded or natural resources can be exhausted, but that's that's uh, an, an approximation. And then the good thing about this definition is that uh, we, we can compute, we can estimate uh, adjusted net savings for 160 plus uh, countries. And that's, that's what the World Bank did. If you have uh, adjusted net savings close to zero, that means that you don't have uh, enough uh, uh, resources to increase your stock of, 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 of capital, and therefore that your capacity to uh, grow sustainably or to, to, uh, to, to, to have economic growth in a sustainable way uh, decreases. And uh, I, I plotted the, the, the adjusted net savings curves for Bolivia, Brazil, the Dominican Republic, uh, Latin America, and the Caribbean uh, uh, as an average, and in Mexico. Uh, notice what I was telling you about Bolivia. Uh, it's the one that had a negative uh, savings. I don't know if you, this is, this is Bolivia, yeah? 
and but the interesting thing here is that even the the country with the highest uh, genuine savings is uh, has yeah, pointer, but it's so bright. You see, it? like I mean, right now it's the green. Ah, yeah, that's why I didn't. Okay, okay. Uh, Ten percent in in savings is very very little to 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 grow, especially for countries that are poor. Look at China. China has a, well, in some aspects and some sectors, a terrible environmental behavior. But they save so much that even when you deduct the environmental damage, they are saving 35% of GDP. That's what they are growing like hell, no? Uh, India, same thing, they are, uh, again, they also have, they, they are not a model of environmental behavior, but they, they save so much that that, uh, that allows them to, to keep on growing despite the environmental damage that they can create. Uh, the US, of course, uh, you all know, uh, has uh, very low savings, all the deficits uh, that uh, created, uh, have created not only an economic crisis, but have also limited the capacity of the U.S. economy to grow in the in the long term. Okay, so this concept of of adjusted net savings is a way to evaluate how sustainable an economy is. Uh, I was asking my my friends before uh, we uh, gathered here for this series of talks. Uh, uh, that if they met the president of, or prime minister of, of their countries, uh, what would they say to this person to convince him or her that uh, polluting now and clean, cleaning up later was a bad decision? Because you can always think and, 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 uh, uh, that uh, if uh, you are expecting to grow, uh, and that's the argument of many countries with regard to climate change, that if you're expecting to grow, you can pollute now and clean up later when you are uh, richer. Why should current generations that are going to be uh, poorer than future generations have to uh, bear the, the costs of, of um, of cleaning up. I think that argument holds, but in only in a very specific set of circumstances. Why? Because it ignores that there are some environmental problems that are irreversible. You can reach thre thresholds and then cleaning up it's impossible. No, for example, if you pollute uh, aquifers, well, once they are polluted, then cleaning them up is a terrible, uh, a very expensive thing to do. Uh, it may also be more economical to start reducing at an early stage uh, because of infrastructure or technological lock-in. Once you have decided certain things of, of, of your uh, technological or, or, or infrastructure growth, then you are locked that. I don't know if, how many of you have seen, it's a very common uh, comparison uh, among uh, urban developers, the comparison between Barcelona and Atlanta. Both uh, cities have almost the same uh, amount of, of inhabitants, but their patterns of, 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 of growth and the patterns of uh, car use and, and, and versus uh, vis a vis public uh, transport are completely different. And, and therefore, uh, pollution per uh, car or pollution per inhabitant. Why? Because, well, Barcelona is very dense and, and concentrates in, 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 a, in the city center, whereas Atlanta spread out. Why? Well, because uh, cars were cheaper or are cheaper in, in, in the US. Uh, uh, gasoline is, uh, has been always cheap and and that's the way that that uh, that uh, uh, 
well, urban growth happened in, 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 most of the, in most of the US. But once you are there, once you have uh, uh, this uh, great urban uh, areas, then that's it. And, and let me give you one, another very interesting example of how this determines not only what you can do from a policy point of view, but also culturally. Uh, drunk driving is a terrible thing to do. Terrible thing to do. Uh, but driving is so important in the US that the US, despite having some important and very strict uh, regulations, they are not nearly as strong and uh, effective as those regulations, for example, in, in Scandinavian countries, where drink is part of the, where drinking is part of the cultural um, heritage. Yeah, why? Because driving is so important in the U.S. If you don't drive, uh, you are completely isolated. Yeah, and if you compare, the, uh, I lived in Sweden for many years. There, uh, people don't have to drive to go to. Uh, their friends' uh, houses and, or to events or whatever, because there are, there's so much public transport, they can walk or they can cycle or whatever. Whereas here, you have to drive. And they, again, even despite having um, some strict uh, uh, laws and regulations, don't, drunk driving is not zero, and it should be zero. <laughs> yeah. Uh, other things, but poor communities may not be heard. And uh, last, but by no means least, uh, some people may not know the important welfare implications of pollution. I was asking my friends uh, over lunch how many people they thought that are killed in Colombia every year because of air pollution. How many people die prematurely in Colombia because of air pollution? Uh, nobody knew that. We did this uh, this exercise uh, with uh, peer reviewed and, and I mean, uh, uh, with all the science uh, behind there and the result that you can imagine. Uh, the results were not contested. Well, were not contested because they knew that we had all the all the evidence. Uh, Six thousand people per year. The Colombians were really um, shocked when six years ago we showed them that more people died because of air pollution than because of violence. Uh, and they changed their ways and they introduced better fuels, uh, monitoring, and lo lots of things that, 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 that changed that. But again, th th this was indirect. They, they, they didn't know that. Um, So how has environmental policy traditionally uh, affected uh, uh, economic growth? Well, um, through, I don't know how many of you uh, um, took environmental economics, but, but uh, environmental economics as a discipline uh, really originated in the early 1970s, and the, and the main uh, the main lesson there was to internalize externalities, external costs, mainly through the pricing of, of externalities. For example, if a company uh, pollutes, let them pay for the damages they they cause, and that will reduce uh, the pollution, the, that will alter the, uh, its behavior until some so social uh, equilibrium optimum is uh, reached, where marginal benefits equal marginal cost. So that was a way to um, uh, affect uh, uh, economic uh, activity through correct pricing, and of course, uh, uh, also through the promotion of, of uh, trade in, in, in green goods. But that, with the concept of, of green growth, has expanded. These two very uh, 
traditional ways in which environmental policy can affect uh, uh, growth have expanded now to uh, include some other uh, ways. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that you are familiar with the concept of a spillover or an externality. When people invest in research and development, they even when they can patent their uh, inventions, discoveries, there are some spillovers that they don't, they don't get all the, the benefits from their uh, investment in, in research and development. And that makes that investment in research and development is below what is considered socially optimum. So investing in, in new uh, technologies is most of the time below what is considered socially optimum. Uh, I'm sure that you have been following the presidential debates. Both Romney and Obama are in favor of research and development. Yeah, of, of, uh, uh, they have, of course, differences, but, but, uh, but uh, they all know that, they both know that uh, research and development uh, uh, if there is no uh, support uh, for research and development, then a country will underinvest in, in, in research and development. Then you can also have underutilization of uh, factors of production uh, because of uh, structural unemployment or other, other reasons. And there are also uh, behavioral biases. It's uh, very difficult for, for a society to make decisions about events that haven't been a part of their tradition, that, that have very low probability of occurring, but that have very, very high, potentially very high costs, such as climate change. So uh, our, our systems are not uh, really designed to, to deal with with those uh, with those events. So, uh, if we take this into consideration, then there are several ways, several additional ways in which the environmental policies can uh, have an impact on, on 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 GDP. And there are there. Of course, you are going to have a copy of the presentation. The case of Mexico. Uh, and this, is, this leads only with a, a low emission strategy. For, of course, green growth is much broader than just climate change, much, much broader. Uh, there are uh, several actions that Mexico can take to lower emissions, including, including uh, energy efficiency, uh, improving public transport, uh, improving waste management, uh, reducing deforestation or promoting afforestation, and also managing agriculture and livestock in a more sustainable way. The investment opportunities of doing all this and reducing uh, carbon emissions by 55% uh, of the goal um, uh, add up to 76, almost 77 billion dollars in eight years. So that's a big, big, big pie for the private sector to participate in. Uh, there are the, uh, we uh, uh, listed the um, activities in which this uh, investment can take place. It's mainly uh, energy efficiency, uh, renewables and uh, some reforestation uh, programs. Well, I'm going to skip this. And uh, of course, renewable energies are becoming more profitable. No. So, what are the obstacles that that uh, renewable energy uh, projects face? Well, uh, they are taxed. Uh, they, 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 the level, the, pl the playing field is no level, no, is not leveled. Uh, traditional sources of creating electricity, for example, uh, are uh, more favorably uh, evaluated at the, uh, Mexico has uh, just one 
utility company it's a nationalized utility company and this utility company is forced to produce at the cheapest uh, with the cheapest technology but the way in which uh, the real costs or the costs are uh, estimated is biased against renewables because uh, they don't take into account e externalities. Uh, there are no carbon offsets yet uh, that where uh, re renewable energy can uh, could take uh, additional uh, uh, income. Uh, with regard to regulations, uh, getting uh, new projects approved is very, very difficult. It takes forever, whereas the traditional uh, ways to produce electricity uh, uh, are uh, again seen in a more favorable way by the by the regulators, and uh, this was also mentioned in the in the in the talk. The regulations for for small producers have not yet been published, and I need to stop. Uh, this is for deforestation. Uh, the, laying, the challenges for the private sector, public policies uncertainty, uh, we mentioned all, also that in the long term, if, if these are long term investments, if, 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 if policies change every three, four years, you cannot uh, introduce uh, new technologies because the, 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 the maturity uh, uh, time uh, uh, is much longer than, than in the, the time in which uh, policies change. Uh, the, the, the technologies have a limited track record and you have to convince uh, people that are not familiar with them to, to adopt them. Limited enforcement, and this was also mentioned uh, several times during the, the talk. Uh, programs with misaligned objectives, Mexico subsidizes fuel, 2% of GDP goes to fuel subsidies. If you subsidize uh, gasoline and diesel and uh, other traditional kinds of fuel, uh, uh, renewables are not, never going to be uh, an, an option, or uh, it's going very difficult that renewables will be an option. And this uh, applies to the forestry programs, the fragmented ownership of the land and incomplete. Chuk, chuk, chuk. Well, what can the government do? Uh, reduce subsidies, promote uh, research and development, uh, increase uh, the facilities to uh, transfer technology, including South-South. There are many examples, very good examples of of South-South uh, uh, technology transfer. Uh, this was also mentioned several times, I think, by Rodrigo. Uh, the importance of certification, that people know when you say this is green, what you mean, and that there, there's only one way to, 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 uh, to measure and that everybody agrees with it. Uh, establishing long-term policies, uh, creating green markets, including perhaps a regional, an American, I mean, the whole America's uh, cap and trade uh, when the time is correct. And, uh, and including uh, all the different producers, uh, different sizes in the regulatory framework. Just to finish the two things that I was going to tell you about, Walmart. Walmart is a very, very profit-oriented company, but things are changing. And Walmart um, in Mexico and, and Central America has introduced a, a, an environmental program that has very ambitious goals. 100% uh, uh, of their energy is going to come from renewables. Uh, as we speak, they, they are recycling almost three quarters of their waste. I mean, they have so many uh, interesting goals and, and none of them is subsidized. The, the investments in, in, in those uh, categories compete with the most profitable uh, um, investments in, 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 in the company. And despite that, of that, uh, they are still uh, working on, 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 on sustainability. 
And the last thing I wanted to tell you about is the equator principles, which, it, uh, which is a, a way to uh, manage uh, environmental and social risk by uh, banks. And uh, well, I guess that I have to stop, but uh, I, I know that a few of you were very interested in, in, in financial um, instruments and the Cueto principles, uh, for, for example, for Costa Rica, uh, Rodrigo, uh, could be a very good way to, to in, uh, induce the financial sector to introduce environmental and social uh, variables. Well, thank you very much. I'm sorry uh, I took so long, but uh, I enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Cletus Springer, the director of the OAS Department for Sustainable Development. Um, I would just like to say if we can limit the presentations to about 20 minutes so we can have some time for um, questions uh, from the audience at the end. Thank you very much and uh, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Cletus. I'm from St. Lucia in the Caribbean, and I invite you to visit at your first opportunity. <laughs> Um, it's a pleasure to be here, thanks to, to uh, Magdalena, and uh, it's good to see Tarsila again after, after quite a few years. Um, I will present to you on the, uh, the, the, the public policy aspects of, of a green economy. Um, and I want to take a different tact to the, to the earlier presentation. I want to come at it from a social, a social policy standpoint. Um, as you know, the, 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 the main blueprint of sorts uh, for the green economy is the, the uh, Alcan document from the Rio Plus 20 conference, which was agreed in, in June. Um, that, that document, as you know, the green economy is being pursued in the context of sustainable development and poverty eradication. Um, there have been mixed reactions um, to the document. Civil society is... is is, is some, some are happy, some see there's opportunities, some see there's not. Um, but civil society is very concerned that in the very second line of the outcome document, there's reference to the, to the suggestion, there's a suggestion that the document was achieved or arrived at with the full participation of civil society, uh, which they claim is never the case, um, that they were not in the main discussion halls and so on. And I believe Tarsila will de deal with that in a little more detail. But the document pays more attention to sustainable development than to a green economy uh, per se. <clears throat> My own view and the view of many um, is that the, the green economy is an important tool that can contribute to eradicating poverty. It can help to boost economic growth um, and, and social inclusion, improve human, human welfare, help to create jobs uh, and, and good jobs, good decent jobs, and maintain the healthy functioning of the of uh, ecosystems. Um, those who support the outcome document are those who hold that view. But there are those who believe that, um, uh, and, and these are set in, in terms of principles in the outcome document, and that is coming largely from the developing countries, who insist that the, the green economy um, concept should not be a rigid set of rules, that it should be considered in the context of sustainable development and poverty eradication in a matter, manner that drives sustained, inclusive, equitable economic growth and job creation and so on. I've underlined these various things because I think they go to the heart of social policy, which is one of the reasons why I've decided to come at the document, at the presentation in that way. Green economy has been defined earlier by Magdalena, and uh, this is the UNEP uh, definition, an economy that results in improved human well-being and social equity while significantly reducing environmental risks and, and ecological uh, scarcity. The benefits of a green economy broadly um, include increased resilience to external shocks. And in the context of the Caribbean, this is very important because the Caribbean countries are suffering from what you might call inherent vulnerabilities. They are, they are small, uh, small size. They have thin markets. Their, their economies are um, they don't have the economies of scale that, enable, that will enable them to engage in various investment activities um, and yield the, the desired returns and so on. So the transition from vulnerability to resilience is one that a green economy can help uh, facilitate. 
Um, it can also produce a more efficient and sustainable economy, a more attractive environment in which to live and work. And the references to Colombia, I thought, were quite striking um, earlier. And the value that you place on people's health, um, the, the, the ability to, to participate productively in the economy and so on, the um, reduction of ill health and so on, these are things that um, help to create a, a green economy environment. A healthier citizenry, productive and sustainable jobs, and natural resources that last. The, the notion of not working at your capital, but using your interests um, instead. <clears throat> I see that the cost of, of the transition to a green economy is negligible when compared to the benefits. Of course, um, it, it's not as straightforward as that. It, it can be very costly, um, especially in the, in the startup phases. But when we consider the ineffectual approaches that are being used to economic growth now, um, I believe that the returns from a green economy approach will be um, significantly higher and at less cost, uh, in the medium to long term at least. Now, the, the social policy context of the green economy um, goes back, you might say, back to Stockholm in, in 1972, and it has moved on. There have been a series of conferences between Stockholm and now the, the, the Conference on Population and Development, for example, um, there have been conferences on finance for development and so on. All of these have harped on the importance of um, the person in the overall context of, of development, that we must move from economic growth, which is a to, to impersonal concept, and, and move to dealing with human development and focusing on the person. Um, the notion that the human being is at the center, both as the means to the end, um, as agents of change and, and the beneficiaries of, of, that, of that change. Now, social policy to me is, is an important entry point to the green economy. Um, and here I suggest that social policy offers a combination. Somebody wants to come in. Uh, that's, a, that's a good sign, I think. <laughs> Um, a combination of implicit and explicit forms of state intervention that directly affect well-being, social institutions, and social relations. Very broadly, its goals, I, and I, I cite five, one, two, three, four, four, four goals of social policy. The goal of re redistribution, that is ensuring that the benefits of economic growth are equitably distributed to spur balanced growth and welfare reforms protection for the more vulnerable sectors of the society. And increasingly, we are seeing that the, the social safety nets that are created through national insurance schemes, social security schemes, and so on, are important um, um, inputs into the economic growth process. In the, in the Caribbean, for example, uh, at least 60% of public sector investment in the economy is coming from these national insurance schemes and so on. They are, they are proving to be a, a very um, 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 active contributor to economic growth in, in, the, in these countries. Production, the production goal, enhancing the productive potential of society, maintaining the health and well-being of people so that they can be um, productive contributors in, this, in the economy and so on. And of course, the, the reproduction goal, the, the goal of maintaining a healthy dependency, dependency ratio between those in the productive sectors and those who are not. Um, and in the Caribbean, this is a big issue. You have um, high unemployment, high underemployment. Um, and so you have a very tiny workforce that, is, that, that many people are dependent on. And I think the ratio is anything in the region of one to, one to four um, in, in some countries. Um, <clears throat> in terms of uh, the key tools that governments can apply in a green economy transition setting, um, references made to it earlier, the, the importance of risk analysis, the importance of priority setting, um, the importance of cost-benefit analysis. And these are simple, time-honored tools that can make a huge difference um, in the transition process. Environmental impact assessments, for example. Integrated development planning. And earlier we spoke about the interlocking circles between social, economic, and environment. Um, how to bring these three domains together in a development planning context is, is very important. And of course, um, deriving win-win options um, from policy um, implementation. The key overarching policies um, that governments 
ought to pursue in the transition to a green, uh, to a green economy. Good governance. It's a sine qua non. You, you can't get anywhere um, if you don't have green gov uh, good governance that, is, um, that transits or, or survives changes in political um, representation, um, changes in government and so on. So it has to be deeply embedded in the, in the culture of governance in, in the countries. Political stability. Barbados, I think, is an example of a, of a small island state that, though it may have changes in, in political representation, is broadly a politically stable uh, environment. The enforcement of the rule of law, absolutely critical. And, and in Rio, over in Mangaratiba in, in Brazil, there was a conference on, on um, the, the, the role of justice, law, um, uh, and governance in the in the green economy process, which I participated in, instead of the the, the main Rio conference, which I thought was less less uh, productive use of my time. Uh, anyway, a sound macroeconomic framework, enhancing labor productivity and labor market flexibility, equality of access to public goods, protection of the environment, innovation, research, and technology, which was referenced um, by our first speaker. In terms of overarching principles, that is the hard and fast positions that governments should adopt um, in the transition to a green economy. Priority settings, I spoke about win-win options earlier. Cost effectiveness, um, market incentives, setting realistic targets and the means and standards of, of enforcement, working with the private sector to mobilize investments through incentives, building constituencies for change, and incorporating at the very early stages of project design environmental concerns um, in, in investment. And I'm sorry I'm going through this very quickly because um, the time is, is at a premium. The key messages um, I think that governments need to embrace in a green economy context is that investments in a green economy help to conserve foreign exchange. Uh, here again in the context of the Caribbean um, this, is, this is absolutely critical. Um, there are some countries in the Caribbean, for example, Barbados, which has only about 2.5 2 months of foreign exchange reserves. Only 2.5 months, maximum three. And Barbados, as you know, is, an e is a tourism economy. And there's a lot more leakage out of that economy than there. So it's a very, very dicey situation. Uh, added to that, you have many countries, uh, islands that have high debt to GDP ratios. St. Kitts and Nevis, for example, has a GDP, debt to GDP ratio of about 120%, um, you know, which is grossly unsustainable. When you're paying more than a dollar to, to uh, repay your debt, you, you have some serious problems. Um, we spoke about decent jobs earlier, a high multiplier effect, um, sustaining human development, market-based but not market-distorting, again was referenced by our earlier speaker. Very quickly, um, I put some ideas down in terms of policy options or policy um, imperatives for governments in these various areas in tourism. As you know, tourism is a, is a two-edged sword. It can bring a lots of, of benefits, but it has lots of costs and it requires careful management to ensure that it does not take out more than it brings in, that it does not deplete or harm natural resources, that it does not exceed the carrying capacity of the host destination, and it, it does not worsen the, the risk profile of host destinations. And unfortunately, in some countries, it does all of these things, <laughs> which, is, which is the irony, the irony of it all. Um, um, but governments can intervene and make a difference because practically every hotel that goes up in a host destination is built with incentives from government. 20, 25, some, sometimes 30 years fiscal incentives. And when you look at the environmental um, 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 conditionalities, quote unquote, that are attached to these incentives, they're, they're practically non-existent. So hotels can dispose of their waste anywhere the effluent can, need not meet any, any standards or guidelines or anything of that sort. They need not conserve energy, um, you know, and so on. Uh, and, and I think governments can get something back 
in return for giving all of these uh, incentives. Sustainable consu consumption and production, this goes to the heart of the manufacturing process. We are doing a lot of work in my department now on, on the notion of closed loop cycles and so on, cradle to cradle, um, cradle to cradle approaches. Yes, I, I saw that coming. Uh, <laughs> and that's why I was trying to get on my bike. Um, you know, I'm green, so, I, 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 you know, so I'm on my bicycle and not on my, uh, on my Porsche. So, uh, so I'm a little slower. So um, <clears throat> I have to slip, uh, um, you know, go through all of these rather quickly. Um, incentive options for um, SCP, tax credits for solar, for example, Barbados, Brazil, St. Lucia have been doing this, rebates on sales and use taxes. The USA in Colorado has been doing this, property tax abasement for solar PV in, in, in New York, subsidies for the purchase of green cars in China, and Ecuador is, is we're working with ex Ecuador on cradle to cradle approaches. Energy, big issue I think, and I will, I will just speak on energy and I will, I will stop here in the, in the next minute because the slides you will have anyway. Um, I'll give you an example. In the Caribbean, energy costs about 27 US cents to produce. 27 US cents. In the United States, it costs between four and seven, four and seven cents kilowatt. per kilowatt hour. Now, you, you get these figures and you ask yourself, how can the Caribbean be competitive in anything? It can't be competitive in tourism because it's, you know, it can't be competitive in manufacturing, can't be competitive in trade. And so it makes sense in any green economy transition process for energy to be the focus, uh, renewable energy to be the focus of that, uh, that, that thing. So governments need to incentivize shifts to uh, renewable energies, reform laws to support IPPs, independent power producers, et cetera. Um, invest in smart grids and, and so on. Um, there are hurdles, the high capital costs, high upfront costs, huge foreign exchange and environmental benefits can come from th those things though. Uh, sustainable transport, uh, lots of inefficient fleets in, in the government um, fleets in many countries, not just in the Caribbean and Latin America as well. Um, these things need to be um, replaced. Water resources, um, we need integrated water resources management policies. Now, natural hazards, many people would think of a green economy and not ever think of natural, ha natural hazard risk management as being an element of, risk man of uh, the green economy. I insist that it is because you cannot have um, business continuity if you have exposure to natural hazard risk. It's as simple as that. Um, and so businesses as well as governments, if the government system breaks down, as happened in, in Grenada, it took as much as six months for the government of Grenada to, to, to come back into business after Hurricane Ivan in 2004. And that cost the country dearly because there was no basis um, for government interventions. The government was basically you know, um, non-existent during that time. So I'm gonna stop here. Um, Magdalena has been, has been very um, tolerant with me. And so I'll stop there, and if there are any other issues, we can talk about it. Thank you. We hear from uh, Tarsila um, Rivera. The only thing is that she's going to speak in Spanish. So if anybody doesn't speak Spanish, I believe you can get uh, your um, your yeah, units. Sí. Okay. Tienes una presentación? No. Okay. Nadie. <laughs> bueno, eh, muchísimas gracias por esta oportunidad de estar aquí. Es eh, un orgullo y también lo considero un reconocimiento porque eh, vengo del sector indígena, eh, les he dado un saludo en la lengua de los incas, que es el quechua, simplemente, y para comprobar que muchas veces eh, creemos que todos nos entienden, pero no nos entendemos muchas veces, y ese es el problema en el mundo, ¿no es cierto? Entonces, eh, 
no quisiera hablar en nombre de la sociedad civil en su conjunto, porque la misma sociedad civil, ustedes saben, somos una gran diversidad, con sectores, intereses y, y depende del escenario en el que nos encontremos. También la sociedad civil son los empresarios para mí, ¿no? Eh, yo quisiera más bien hablar como mujer, como indígena, como mujer, y que en las Américas somos más o menos entre 45 y 50 millones. Y si hablamos de los pueblos indígenas o los pueblos originarios, también tendríamos que ubicarnos en ese contexto. ¿Dónde estamos los pueblos indígenas, las mujeres indígenas, la niñez indígena, la juventud indígena? Eh, si nos ubicamos en, ese, en un escenario rural, ¿no?, eh, Seguramente, si relacionamos ese escenario con las oportunidades que nos han mostrado de la economía verde, eh, veremos que estamos hablando del uso de los recursos que esos pueblos eh, han cuidado eh, durante miles de años, ¿no? pero que le estamos dando una oportunidad económica para desarrollar este, sí, generar economía y eh, mejores condiciones de vida, más bien material, como nos ha explicado el, el, el doctor Cletus y el, y el doctor que no voy a decir su nombre, Juan Carlos. <risa> Entonces, eh, Juan Carlos. ese es el escenario eh. rural, donde estamos todavía en la gran mayoría en condiciones, en la mayoría de países, ¿ah? ¿eh? en condiciones donde no se tiene acceso en igualdad de condiciones a la sociedad en general. Or, y la um, principal barrera creo que tiene que ver con la educación. Y la educación, una educación de calidad que nos dé oportunidad quality. como a cualquier otro. Y por lo tanto también, si relacionamos con la, la oportunidad de la economía verde, es como This una joven de este tiempo que se educa en una provincia andina de cualquier parte de los países del sur, eh, podría, por ejemplo, desarrollar oportunidad profesional, oportunidad ocupacional y oportunidad de desarrollo económico sostenible con la concepción que hemos manejado los pueblos indígenas. ¿Qué significa? Eh, ser parte del medio en el que, no, que hemos nacido, ser parte de ese entorno donde seres that. humanos y naturaleza se consideran uno. Y por considerarse uno, Nature se ejerce eh, un mutuo And servicio. ¿Qué quiere decir? Unity que si yo necesito el pasto, of mutual service. No, What does that mean? Eh, tenía los camélidos que The, comían uh, el pasto, grass cortando el pasto, podando, no jalando y depredando el pasto. Pero cambiamos esto por animales que sí jalan el pasto y la depredan. Entonces, ahí hay un cambio y tiene que ver con la concepción cultural en el que nos desenvolvemos en los medios. Entonces, yo creo que esa es una de las principales diferencias en relación al fomento de la economía verde y las oportunidades, por ejemplo, de crecimiento económico, la lucha contra la pobreza y la generación de empleo. Que los pueblos indígenas nos encontramos con muchas uh, todavía brechas muy visibles y difíciles de superarla, que tiene que ver con la educación y con la concepción del uso de los recursos para ello. Si seguimos hablando de este espacio rural, tenemos el otro problema. Eh, si sí, hay una oportunidad de generar, por ejemplo, productos para el biocombustible, se dice, ¿no? Eh, combustible, digamos, más ecológico, estamos pensando dónde vamos a sembrar, en qué tierras vamos a sembrar y qué recursos vamos a usar para ello. ¿Qué quiere decir? Quiero relacionar solo la canola o la caña de azúcar. Entonces, eh, si bien el Estado dice vamos a promover el consumo de biocombustible en relación al petróleo o el gas, entonces eh, se fomenta las grandes inversiones para, esta, para estos cultivos. ¿Qué depreda? 
el tema del agua se convierte en un problema porque no tenemos ese uh, recurso natural, no es renovable ni, ni a, aparece por uh, arte uh, de no. magia, porque habría mayor consumo de agua. Luego también desaparecerían, por Water, ejemplo, del mercado then, la producción de alimentos sanos, porque crops, se fomentaría el monocultivo. Food staples eh, would disappear from the market tanto, because there would be a promotion uh, of uh, monocrop, single crops. Then if we talk about the goals for the millennium, eh, de, de the issues of por ejemplo, esas malnourishment, los que las uh, where de would those opportunities concentrate? Eh, it would be por ejemplo, de in the places where también, people eh, own large tracts of land. Eólica, ¿no? When we're y talking about, for example, energy, Tenemos, wind eh, energy, hydro energy we, we have issues eh, with all of those la things civil so que está, civil eh, society no that's solo struggling de las personas, fighting sino for their rights, not only human rights, the rights of people, but the right also recursos, for new generations si to de las still enjoy de la verde. these resources. ¿Por Porque desde un lado, como lo hemos visto perfectamente en los expositores anteriores, and eh, why? vemos una gran oportunidad, pero yeah, seguramente que vemos una oportunidad uh, para un determinado sector an opportunity, but we see an opportunity that's only for a specific okay. sector and based pero on only one. Si estas propuestas van a atentar uh, but con el empobrecimiento de la tierra, con la desaparición de recursos land, no renovables, va a encarecer los uh, productos, de, o sea, los, eh, los alimentos en el mercado para la gran población. No sé si estamos the, resolviendo el asunto. Uh, uh, ¿no? I don't know if we're Entonces, the problem, then. Eh, siendo indígenas del área rural, nos As encontramos con estos problemas. Of, in those rural Brasil, areas, those are the problems eh, we confront. If we look at Brazil and, for example, canola, how uh, eh, the uh, planting of canola is being incentivized a campesinos que no tienen tierra, large extent, a movimientos and the sin tierra que quieren tierra, has to un face also de, movements sí, from people who don't own the land, the land and who are claiming the land, peasants who want to improve their economic situation. Entonces, so the government eh, se piensa, por ejemplo, at those en el lands in indigenous río, uh, areas, y de los y los recursos naturales para todo tipo de the de use para of economía. the land, the use of natural resources, Puede tener of water, una verde, for everything cierto, that can generate an economy. It may have, roja, many other cases, it's had, it's had a red label. Uh, fortunately, there's a process eh, by which sobre el even que hay the de corporate sector eh, is becoming aware eh, of the danger con roja como, como to, to uh, promote, I'm sorry, with a red label as the uh, impact of no, climate change eh, has shown us. Because eh, this is all a process este, which que the fact con el que no tenemos derecho resources ninguna persona no venga de donde venga de right expoliarla o de exterminarla porque tenemos the right una responsabilidad con la we don't have the right to eliminate because we have a responsibility to Ahí future generations and to human life and that's where we see conflicts we see conflicts que los pueblos indígenas o las comunidades que nos oponemos por ejemplo uh, a la explotación irracional de, de la minería del petróleo Opposed to the árboles, Russian exploitation of the oil of trees, of the use of war. Uh, we're opposed to opening a gigantic transnational uh, highway. And we're Quizás asked, are you being positive or you, no are you against pasando, development? Es que, But maybe eh, what's not happening is that there's no mutual understanding between the parties. Y con and we cannot develop programs that involve participation, that uh, involve dialogue, no and that result in mutual benefits. Think only in five-year este, terms because of our este, uh, government terms. And there's a lot of politics. And the governments think that they're going to 
earn votes or that they're going to generate this economic growth. I come from Peru as a country that is showing great economic growth. However, if we look in depth and if we look, for example, at the market for healthy foods, that the indigenous peoples have inherited a culture of production, a culture for the use of resources, that could last for about seven years, like, for example, the Inca technology for the conservation and preservation of food. We still have so the, the state of economic growth based on that fact that we have that diversity, the diversity of uh, plants and food staples that we have in the Andean region and in the Amazon. Now, if we want to promote the economy, to grow the economy, the economic policy of states is based practically on the exploitation of these resources. So the peoples are asking to be involved in the design of these. have been able to do this, to achieve this. People peoples, uh, the World Labor Organization also has and that has the weight of law and states should respect that. Finding that right to the free uh, determination, to the free will to decide where we live and what we eat, by our informed consent on issues that have to do with our lives, has to do with the use of our resources and the territories where we're located. And uh, two international, international tools are uh, linked to individual rights and collective rights, the rights of peoples to be recognized for their contribution to humanity and as individuals, as persons respected like every other person. So Vemos we como un gran potencial que tendríamos los pueblos indígenas para justamente indigenous peoples eh, garantizar la sostenibilidad de la vida. To guarantee the sustainability sí, pues, of life. Poquito, uh, digo, uh, we need to change some things. No you know, somebody who's earning 500%, <laughs> why don't they... Rápido. Why are they happy with just earning 100% but without depleting all the resources? Uh, when we talk about the economy, even us, the indigenous peoples, uh, argue amongst ourselves about what economic growth means. And again, we're not against economic development. We're not against having better material conditions. But we also care about spiritual life. Talk to live Y la educación y la y los derechos ciudadanos good quality eh, of life, y good quality of health, a good level of citizen este, rights that allow us to participate in the economic, países, social, cultural, and political life of our countries. No uh, in the peoples, we're, we're not thinking we, we don't want to continue living in ghettos. Uh, the world is a dynamic place, and we, también, as peoples, sí, pues, este, we are also, as the Italians say, we're having this adjournment up with the times. So we have to take advantage of technological and scientific improvements, but this needs to contribute to a life that's sustainable in every aspect. So uh, when we are exploding, exploiting mines in a responsible way, when they say that, we would like to know what does this mean. 
viendo, por ejemplo, cómo los desechos de la minería están dañando la vida de las mujeres, están haciendo que niños y animalitos no estén deformes, cuando el agua de los ríos donde están los pueblos indígenas, andinos y amazónicos están contaminados, los árboles están en el suelo porque hay tráfico de madera, los animales en los bosques desaparecen, nuestros propios animalitos ya están comiendo eh, alimentos uh, transgénicos our entonces como dicen el pollo tiene cuatro pechugas for, en vez de una pechuga like normal say, you know, now chicken entonces have hay todo four este cambio instead of just que en realidad one. Uh, so tiene un impacto en la, en la salud de las personas entonces los pueblos indígenas health. simplemente so, The indigenous eh, peoples, eh, ver we would si, simply like eh, to see if, como dice el papel, ¿no? as Cletus, the paper says, Cletus, um, el papel, como decía mi padre, aguanta todo. <laughs> paper, anything eh, can be put on paper, as my dad said, uh, but what is lacking is la and the commitment and the political will, the political decision of the authorities Nosotros in our nos, countries. Uh, we have become sí, very concerned mucho when, for las, example, in Peru, los recursos que los pueblos the indígenas y los indígenas hemos conservado the indigenous para, la, peoples para are being ingresos, sold por ejemplo, ya to generate turismo, income, whether by recursos. tourism or the exploitation eh, of resources. ¿Cuáles son las condiciones que ese gobierno, que el Estado peruano pone a los inversionistas extranjeros para que no dañen los recursos ni los depreden ni tampoco dañen la vida humana como no se lo permitirían a ellos? Lo único que se les pide es que el ejercicio de las decisiones políticas con responsabilidad sea la decisión de las decisiones políticas con responsabilidad y con respeto al pueblo debe responder del ejercicio de su mandato. Y eso implica, en realidad, legislar y tomar decisiones poniendo puesto las cartas sobre la mesa. Y yo creo que si hay empresas nacionales que tienen que seguir desarrollando su economía, They need to keep improving de, their economy de, de through the investment in other eh, countries. But these countries have to no impose reasonable conditions mundo, so that we don't continue ni vayamos creciendo aceleradamente y luego tenemos un en el organismo porque la China, por ejemplo, vemos que según su cuadro, la China es envidiable pero la China también es un ejemplo a seguir y qué está pasando What's happening? What's happening with all of the economic power? What's happening in the rest of the world due to development in China? Frankly, they broke the textile industry in Peru. Now everything is plastic there. And they also don't want to assume the responsibility of not polluting by investing in cleaner industries. So uh, development has to be undertaken responsibly. Estamos desarrollando económicamente. What ¿Y qué significa esto en relación a los recursos And que what does this mean in relation to the resources Entonces, that should last sí tenemos que tener, for mankind? Eh, so we que have to no have this eh, very clear uh, non-renewable si resources. I don't know. En, we will be able to just no sé live Pero on, on no. pills Entonces, one day. I don't eh, believe so. But <laughs> we have to be y con uh, las políticas que a nivel consistent se dando with en a la the policies de la de y at the global level uh, relating to the de la tierra y la naturaleza para que sigamos produciendo that alimentos means por el mundo. cleaning the earth so, and respecting the earth so that we can continue producing año, healthy foods for the world maybe we do not need to change our cars every year maybe we can use public no transportation have better public transportation that does not pollute and de we bienestar. need to think that no maybe the external signs of, of uh, wealth don't necessarily mean well-being. <laughs> okay, I think we only have five minutes um, for questions, so 
uh, depending on how many questions we have, we might have to group them. And please indicate who your questions were. Sorry? I think uh, a little bit for, for the three of you. Thank you very much. This is a kind of different question. It's not going to be technical or based in economic data. I, I, I'm just curious because we are all working the green topic daily. Do you really think we're going to solve this? Um, do you honestly think we as humans are going to get into the point in which we reach um, a balanced, uh, fair relation with ourselves and with the planet? Or do you think we are basically taking advantage of the moment to gain um, interesting business models for the next 20 years? Do you know what I mean? Because, yeah, y you think about it from time to time w when you are seeing what's happening outside. And, yeah, I'm just curious on that topic. Do you want to go first? Uh, well, <laughs> um, fascinating question. Um, of course, I think that we can improve the way we live and, and, and behave. Otherwise, uh, I wouldn't be working on this. Uh, do I think that we are going to solve definitely everything and that uh, uh, we are going to have bliss on Earth uh, in the near future? Of course not. <laughs> but, uh, but I definitely think that we can improve the way we live, that we can improve it for, and we should improve it for everybody. Um, and there are plenty of uh, indicators that show that it can be that it can be done um, Tarsila was talking about China China of course is no model of environmental behavior but the fact is that almost 200 million people have come out of poverty in 20 years 200 million of course it it's 800 million too few <laughs> <laughs> in the case of China, <laughs> but uh, but it has been in, in t 10, 20 years, and uh, and I'm sure that uh, uh, with more resource efficiency, uh, taking into consideration the the impact that they produce on the environment, they can uh, take out of poverty a similar number in 20 years and without the very high environmental costs. I mean. Uh, that's why we study. I mean, I, the, the, uh, we know the, the science, we know the public policy, we know the uh, political obstacles, we know the cultural obstacles, and they are huge. Of course they are huge. But uh, uh, I think that uh, humans are um, clever enough to, to come up with, uh, with solutions to, to, to these problems. But uh, I'm, not, I'm not naive. Of course, I'm, I'm, we're not going to see a definite solution. But take any, I don't know if you're familiar with the Club of Rome, but I'm willing to take a bet on how many people are going to come out of poverty in the next 20 years. If you think that there, as a percentage of human population, there are, there are going to be more poor people in 20 years, we can make a, a bet, substantial bet. <laughs> Not like Mitt Romney's <laughs> bet, but, <laughs> but substantial enough. Uh, and uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm an optimistic. I'm, I'm an optimist, sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so am I. I'm optimistic as well. Um, Back in 1990, when I, in March 1990, when I visited Mexico uh, City, it was so polluted that I couldn't breathe. Uh, I came away with an inflammation of the optic nerve from breathing in the particulate matter um, and so on. Uh, when I went back there two years ago, it had dramatically improved. Um, this time, 10 years ago, we, airlines were not talking about using biofuels as an alternative. 
um, to jet fuel for flying. Now we are almost at the at the doorstep of that invention. Virgin uh, Airlines has taken the, the lead on this. Um, Ten years ago, Marks and Spencers was not um, saving 80 percent or reducing its waste by 80 percent, or Walmart wasn't doing the same thing. Um, so obviously, you need a critical mass for there to be substantial, substantial and, sub and sustained change. Um, but I think we're on the road to getting there. Martina, ¿quieres comentar algo? I'm, I'm also hopeful, <laughs> otherwise I would not be here. And yes, yes, we also believe in the new generations. People will come up that will be more critical about the way the world is developing. And uh, as part of the indigenous sector, I have to say, it's taken us 23 years to come up with a declaration of the rights of the indigenous people at the UN. For 10 years, we worked to find a space where indigenous people can go year after year now uh, to New York and talk about our issues. And this also means that many times the obstacles are like within our own countries. Because for me, for instance, it's a lot harder to talk to somebody, uh, intellectual middle class person in my own country. It's a lot harder for me to talk to them than to be invited here. And you can see that. And you see, because unfortunately, we're always talking about the differences. And we're not talking about the affinities we have, what we have in common. So there is a lot of colonialism, there is a lot of racism, there is a lot of discrimination in our countries, and that is a huge obstacle because resources are not distributed. Uh, they're not the same. I mean, I'm not going to give anything to the other because they're not as much, you know, they, they are not valued as much as I am. So these are our countries still have some, you know, colonial influences left. That doesn't mean that when we get to power, uh, you know, it would be the, the opposite. I think we have to grow ourselves as well. And uh, on the other hand, I, I think that these discussions uh, generate uh, a critical mass or a critical attitude so that governments that didn't used to see uh, can, in a way, start changing. And I think the same thing has to happen with the people that make the money. We have to keep insisting. We have to keep talking about that social responsibility. And, uh, you know, for instance, I come from a sector where they consider us in extreme poverty. I'm totally against donations and gifts because they paralyze us. We believe in investment, investment for training and development to learn about the new needs and to be able to contribute to the development of our country. I'm really not for policies, uh, structural policies, that you can uh, overcome one certain situation only. I think it has to do with sustainability. I think at the time when we can really talk about sustainability, when we can have a vision about sustainability, once we do something, this something is going to guarantee that we can eat and sleep and live well into the future. And uh, this is not going to be directed at just particular interest or something specific. The, I'm not as optimistic about the future in the short and immediate term, or, or the immediate term, I guess, because the, the logic of the world economy today is all about growth. When we reach zero growth in this country, for example, the United States or any other country, that is not acceptable. The whole economic system is geared on more and more and greater consumption and deeper consumption and, and more of everything. And I, I'm not sure that that is sustainable without challenging the fundamentals of capitalism itself. I'm not sure that, that I'm that optimistic. I think there is a, a fundamental tension in the way we deal with the world economy today and what we're trying to accomplish when we talk about environmental uh, degradation and the protection of, of the environment. Yes, 
Yeah, you, you're right, but that's changing. Um, uh, do you look at um, the OECD countries, for example, um, where there's a stronger emphasis now on, on welfare. Um, the, the Nordic countries, for example, um, clearly place a higher premium on quality of life and so on and economic growth. I mean, obviously, you need, you need some measure of, of wealth creation to pay for the welfare gains. It cannot also all, you know, only be through taxes and so on. Um, but you're right, the, the tensions are there. Um, and not only that, the inequalities, are, the inequities, the playing field is not, is not level. Um, we see regression on a number of environmental agreements, for example, Kyoto and so on. Um, I was at a, at a conference at uh, New York University last year on climate change when I was appalled to hear professors and so on advocate um, kicking the can down the road because it will be, it will be, um, the future will be better able to pay for the cost of restoration, you know? Uh, you know, just the, the, the reverse of the argument we've been making, that, that we cannot burden future generations with that, they, they came at it in the other way and said, listen, it will be cheaper to do it in the long term. So you have these tensions, as you say, that exist. Um, but what we need to, and we, we're getting there, I mean, I'm not sure though, I think we would have made a lot more progress if we were not too UN-centric in the approach that we have taken over these last 20 years. All of the thinking has come out of the UN system, which is not, as you know, the best place for, for, for thinking sometimes. But when I look at what the private sector has achieved, the global private sector over the last 20 years is phenomenal. Uh, I think it depends on, on, on whether or not the society is able to become more efficient in the use of resources, uh, promote more resilient uh, ways of uh, production and consumption. And uh, growth doesn't necessarily mean material growth. Mm. I mean, uh, uh, I hope you are enjoying this. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, we are creating welfare by learning now. That's right. And uh, I think that in the future, uh, people will uh, learn to, to, and of course, the productive sector will uh, respond to that to enjoy things that are not necessarily, that use more materials. No, look at the ways, in, at the way in which uh, uh, developed countries have changed the uh, productive sectors. I mean, serv the service industry is now yep. just as important and more important in, in, in many countries. And, and that's the way it's going to be. We are, we are going to use, uh, uh, hopefully, uh, uh, resources uh, in a much more efficient way, and uh, most people will uh, enjoy and be involved in, 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 in non-materialistic uh, um, activities. Uh, of course that the world cannot sustain, uh, I say this well, uh, uh, a million cities like a big, American city, no? I mean, there is no steel, there are no resources for that, but we're going to, I mean, uh, resources as they grow uh, uh, scarcer are become, going to become more expensive, and then that will create the incentives. When, when, when gasoline uh, gets expensive, the, the auto industry responds. Why are cars the way they are in Italy, and why are cars the way they are in the US? Yeah. Because Italians like f mini Fiat? Yeah. No, <laughs> of course not. <laughs> because, because gasoline is 10 times more expensive in, in, in Italy than in the US. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm, I'm, again, optimistic, not very optimistic, but optimistic. People uh, will learn to, to, to uh, find ways out of this, and let's hope that that uh, we don't have to see the the the, the wolf in in, 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 in their eyes, uh, in, in his eyes, uh, to to change our ways, and, and and that our leaders and 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 we are uh, 
far-sighted enough to 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 promote uh, this these changes. But I'm uh, I'm sure that that uh, we can sustain seven billion, eight billion, nine billion uh, if we m become more uh, resource efficient. We will have the adequate policies, and and we focus on education on. Uh, personal relations. I mean, how many uh, people are now doing a, a, a living out of, 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 of coaching people how to behave and how to be nice and, and how to lose weight? And, I mean, uh, uh, the, the economy is changing, and it will keep changing. Tercila, I don't know if you want, si quieres hacer un comentario final, porque ya tenemos que... Sí. Mm -hmm. um, capitalismo, capitalismo. Well, capitalism is Aunque capitalism, we, we can paint it green, Pero but it's still capitalism. And uh, I think we have to, we have to look at a cultural change because si if we, if things keep going the way they are, is because there is, uh, you know, there's people still eh, consuming the way they are. So we have to change many things. We have to change attitudes that are part of uh, people's culture, and that has to be changed in that regard. I just wanted to mention that once I went to Finland and I was very surprised when I saw the water pipes, the, the ones that go to the shower, and they're outside the walls. They're not inside the walls like they're in our house. I touched it and it was warm. And I said, why? Why do you have these exposed pipelines? And they said, to me, well, they recycle the water, the, the, the water that you use in your sink, they have a, they recycle this water for the whole house, and that recycled water is what, you know, warms up the rest of the house, it heats the house, and I say, well, why, how come you don't teach us the same thing? Because then I discover all the water that we uh, use in our house, it ends up going to the sea, to the ocean, and all the water that goes to the ocean, the fish end up eating all the, you know, all the waste that we send from our houses, from our homes. So if I hadn't seen it, I wouldn't have known they do that. So I think technology and investment um, and this exchange of knowledge and experience has to lead us to new situations where we can enjoy life and uh, it should be something different, not, you know, washing your towels every day or, or throwing your wastewater into the ocean and then you are left with no fish to eat. So I think culture has to change. And some aspects of these indigenous cultures, people look at them as, as behind or old. And when we look today, we, we, we see they're not, the, you know, the, we're not in the past. We, due to different circumstances, since the, the state has forgotten gotten to design you know, policies for us. They did not include us in the policies. So that isolation has really been an opportunity to keep being ourselves. And now when we look outside and when we look inside, we see we do have many things to share. And for that, we would have to have an equal relationship. And the other culture that used to see us as something that was negative, they would have to change so we can establish this dynamic of mutual learning for, you know, for mutual benefit for more questions, but please um, help me in thanking our very insightful and uh, inspiring uh, panelists today at the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you.